I was born in 1925, on November the 8th, and uh, that makes me 82 right now, as of interviewing. My hometown was a city called Mukachevo in Czechoslovakia. Now, uh, that same city was part of the Czechoslovak Republic until 1938. November 1, 1938, my hometown, per agreement between uh, Hitler and Mussolini and uh, Chamberlain and uh, the French Prime Minister, uh, have turned it over to Hungary. So in November of 1, my hometown became Hungary. And it was Hungary uh, when I was taken away and sent to the concentration camp. And when I came back, for, and it was only for one day, I found out that my hometown now belonged to the USSR. So that's when I said goodbye, and next day I left. My hometown, Mukashevo, or in Hungarian, Munkaj, was a town of about 27,000 inhabitants, a small town. However, of those 27,000, about 16,000 were Jews. So in a sense, it was a Jewish town. There was a town when there came the Sabbath, all the stores closed down. And you saw all the very religious Jews with their caftans and their fur hats going to services. It was a business town. To the north of my hometown began the Carpathian Mountain. To the south of my hometown were the valleys, the flatlands for agriculture. And my hometown was the, so to say, the business area where the flatland producers brought their wares and the, and the mountain producers brought their wares and it was kind of a business uh, town. Uh, it was a, not a manufacturing town as such. Uh, life was <laughs> because I am remembering tranquil, you know. Uh, I guess every young person remembers his life 60, 70 years ago as tranquil. Um, and tranquilly, my, my job was get up in the morning, go to services, and then go have a slight breakfast, go to school, where I stayed in school until 1 o'clock in the afternoon, six days a week, come home, have lunch, and then back to religious studies. And that's how it went for until I was about 17 years old, even when the government changed somewhat. Uh, my father was a, uh, had a store. Uh, he was a, uh, the store was a bookstore, but it was more of a paper bookstore, um, re, you know, novels, as well as school books. So we supplied for the city a great deal of their reading material, the writing material, the school supplies, as well as the books. Because in uh, our hometown, my hometown, uh, books were something that a student bought on his own. It was not given to him by the school. So uh, this is what my father was. He opened that book store and uh, right after World War I, uh, my grandfather, my father's father, my paternal grandfather, left my hometown and came to America back before World War I. He worked here as a cigar roller and he sent money back home and when he felt that it was enough money to do something, he came back home himself. Interestingly enough, both my grandparents my maternal grandfather and my paternal grandfather were in the United States at the same time. But they were all came here to make some money and to go back. Because it was felt that that kind of life which they wanted to lead, namely a Jewish life, was more feasible in the old country rather than in America. I was the oldest. Uh, then my brother, Benjamin, 
He was born in 1930, and I has a sister, Esther, and she was born in 1934. Uh, my mother, uh, a wonderful, wonderful, quote, Jewish mother, uh, take, took care of us, was very good to us, was very warm, uh, very warm and caring person. And in that regard, we had a wonderful life. Can you imagine that in the 18 years that I lived, quote, at home, you know, before I was taken away, I never heard a single disagreement between my parents. I once went to a friend of ours, a friend of mine, and uh, next door, mother and father were arguing. I excused myself and I went home. I could not take that argument. It disturbed me because I have grown up without ever hearing an argument in my house between my parents. My mother was born in a small little town, 36 kilometers, I'm sorry, 56 kilometers, about 30 miles from uh, my hometown up in the mountains. And uh, in those days, marriages were arranged marriages. And, uh, you know, they didn't date as such. The, the marriage broker came with the pictures you found out about a family. The most important thing in marriage at that time in my life, you know, was if you marry, you two families are reunited. And in that, in that way, it was important to find out who you marry. What, not, not the girl, but the family. Or not the man, but the family. Because you can predict what a man and a woman is going to be by what their experiences were in their family, what the family status is, what the family is thought of in the community, uh, how they think of them. You all required about the status of that family in the community to ascertain, ascertain the, uh, the extent to which they, uh, uh, that you want to marry into, a family that you want to marry into. So they too got married in 1923. And uh, this was the results. So uh, my mother came from a small little village, maybe 25 families living in the whole village. It was called Tolomash. There were no, no, no uh, electricity, uh, no water, uh, no streets, no highways. It was a mud road. And I loved to go as a young boy when it rained, out without my shoes, and squish this mud in the road and feeling it's oozing through your toes. It was a delightful, sensuous feeling. Since my life was a good life with good parents, everything in it, in it you know, was treasured. Life revolved around holidays. The Jewish life was always punctuated by the various holidays. And so the kind of life, the Sabbath life, the holiday life, the family life, the, the visitation with the family, you know, visitation with, the, with the, my neighbors. I would come home from services. And I was about a boy of five, four or five years old. I told my mother, look, I'm not going to eat here today. I'm going over to our neighbors, she makes a better cholent than you do, you know? And I would go and I would come in, I would sit down and I would eat. Uh, doors were open. Uh, you walked in in people's homes and you were welcomed. So it was a really what you would call a Gemeinschaft, uh, a very convivial atmosphere in living. Life was hard. Working was hard, you know, but the conviviality of life oftentimes made it better than if you were had money and life would have been emotionally uh, bare. I was aware of this bifurcation, of this separation between Jewish and the non-Jewish world in my hometown. All my friends were Jewish. 
uh, even when I became a teenager, it was uh, this this sense of separation was quite with me. I went to a school that was Jewish. Even my high school was Jewish. So all my friends were always Jewish. I never dated, not until I was older, a non-Jewish girl. I wouldn't know even what to talk about or what to do because I would not, I, I did not know what the Christian culture was like. I was Im immersed in my own, uh, my own culture, you know. Uh, so I did not know. I knew there was a separation, but I did not know what that separation was. However, there were some indications. Eh? Um, for instance, when I went up to my grandmother's uh, place, that little village up in Talmash, on Easter time, on Passover or uh, Christian Easter, and when it was Easter Sunday, my, I was advised that I would not better. It would be better if I were not to go out, because uh, at that time the sermons were so anti-Jewish that. Uh, it frequently happened that they were attack upon Jewish boys and even on Jewish adults upon the stimulation of the stories of the death of Christ, you know, uh, looking on, on Jews as, uh, as the Christ killers, uh, as the day that committed deicide, you know. So I, this was very much uh, in my mind that there was a, some great separation between these two cultures. And, uh, and of course, later on, when the Hungarians, when Czechoslo Czechoslovakia, my, home, I said, my hometown was Czechoslovakia until 1938. Czechoslovakia I must add, was a most democratic country of all countries that have ever existed, including the famous Greek democracy. You know, when we create something so beautiful, eventually we destroy it. We cannot take something which is very great. Let me give you an example of what, what made Czechoslovakia so great. It came into being in 1918. And the first president of Czechoslovakia was a pro professor, doctor, Thomas Garik Masaryk. He was a professor of sociology. To him, the importance of maintaining cultural tru uh, truism, truisms of their culture for each, for each people, or they maintaining, um, giving the opportunities for a minority group to maintain their own lifestyle was very important. Hence, all in my hometown we had five different nationalities, each had their own school system. And the Germans who lived in my hometown were able to go to a school which was taught in German. As the Czechs went to a school taught in Czech, as the Hungarians went, went to a school taught in, in their own language. When Masaryk died, the next president of Czechoslovakia was his student, Dr. Edward Benesch. He was the new president. And he followed with the teachings set up by his master, Thomas Garik Masaryk. So even though there was, you know, there were these different nationalities, but the relationship in a sense was cordial. But when the Hungarians came in in 1938, they brought with them the anti-Jewish laws. And then uh, I became much, much more aware of the separation between Jewish and non-Jewish separation. They brought in anti-Jewish laws. These laws began with what, what you call numerous clauses laws. Uh, numerous clauses is making a, a specific uh, percentage of Jews who are allowed to do certain things. So, uh, it, be, it immediately began with the idea of 7% of all businesses could be Jewish. Now, look at my hometown. 
a town where in which about two-thirds of the population was Jewish. And two-thirds of the stores, or more than two-thirds of the stores, 80% of the stores were in Jewish hands. What has such a law done? Two of my uncles immediately lost their uh, license to uh, have a business. Luckily, my father did have the li his license, continued to have his license. Uh, there was first a numerous clauses in the universities. There were, they admitted only 7% of all students could be Jewish. And then later on they changed it to numerous nullus, which meant no Jew can attend college. So immediately uh, you knew there was a great difference because it became official difference. Jews could not serve in the armed forces. They were serving as working battalions attached to the armed forces. So the separation was now clear, decisive, and legal. Life continued to be, although difficult, but uh, we continued to be with hope. In 1940, uh, I'm sorry, 1939, a year after the Hungarians, or less than a year, a few months after the Hungarians took over my hometown, I was 13 years old. I wrote a letter to my uncle in the United States. I sent him a copy of my birth certificate, uh, pictures, whatever else I had, and I asked him, take me out of here. As a boy of 13, I sensed that this is, the future is not great in this country. Well, there were other things too. I loved America. Uh, I was in love with American movies. Uh, I have never missed movies like uh, Broadway Melodies. I loved American jazz. Uh, I fell in, when I was 12, I fell in love with Diana Durbin. I don't know, if, I don't think you know who she is, okay? And of course, I have seen all the Andy Hardy movies. My desire to come to America is of very, <laughs> as a young boy, I already formed an opinion because on the one hand, I felt America's freedom, the personal, the individual freedom, that was much greater than it was in my old hometown. But my parents believed to hunker down. Things are not good, but hunker down. You must understand that Jewish history is a long history. And for the last 2,000 years, Jews were attacked every so often uh, and were killed and, and revived, you know. They rose up again from the ashes of the destruction, like Phoenix. And so my father believed, hunker down, the war is not going to last too much longer. And indeed, by late 1943, by 19, beginning of 1944, we saw the handwriting on the wall that Germany is falling, uh, is, is losing the battle. The Americans were already in Italy. They were coming north. Uh, things are going to last for a little time, and that, that's going to be over. But March the 15th of 1944, the Hungarians took over, I'm sorry, the Germans took over Hungary. And when they took over Hungary, immediately they turned to their most intense problem. It was not to save Germany, but to kill the Jews. As soon as they came in to my hometown, about two days later, they already made a ghetto. They forced the people to leave their homes and move into the ghetto. Luckily, my uh, home was inside the ghetto, so family came to live with us, you know. And we didn't stay in the ghetto too long, because soon we were gathered from the ghetto and the process of being sent to the concentration camps began. So that was a kind of a sudden turn of events that began on March 15th, 1944. Things were not good before, 
but we're tolerable enough to hope that we can survive the war and the Allies will win and things will be over soon. But that changed. We were in the ghetto, as I told you, and it was one Friday morning when uh, gunshots woke us up. I looked out the window and I saw that um, that Hungarian soldiers and Hungarian army with some others in, uh, in the middle and, uh, with them were going from home to home and shooting their guns into the air. I did not know what that was all about, but I soon found out. Hungarian soldiers and police came into my home, told us that we have 15 minutes to pack up that which is more food and clothes that we want to carry with us. We cannot pack up more than what we can carry and be outside on the street within 15 minutes. To emphasize their, the severity of the situation, they shot into the ceiling and using the butt of their gun hit me and hit my father. That was emphasis. I was 18 years old, you know, so the emphasis was clear and unmistakable. We were taken out, we, we, we packed up, mostly food, and we uh, went out onto the street. From there we marched a few miles to the edge of the city. There was a brick factory where that was the gathering uh, area of all the people, not only from my city, but from the surrounding area also. Why the brick factory? Because the brick factory had these um, areas that had uh, roofs where they had the uh, green bricks, you know, the, the unbaked bricks standing there and they had to be um, protected from the rain. And this was very, very large so they could put thousands and thousands of people there. And indeed we stayed there for a few days my aunt came from another town. My grandmother from the, from the north in Tolomash was brought. My grandfather died by that time. And then after about three or four days in that brick factory, suddenly trains came. We were packed in into the trains to be taken wherever they were taking us. The Germans were clever. They utilized Jews to lie for them. Um, they promised them that they will have a good, those who went to lie for them, they promised them that they will be given special treatment, which they did not get. What the Germans carried, you know, uh, the message, what these carried the German message was, don't worry where you are going, uh, we need workers, you and your family will be housed together and you'll be working and uh, that's what we need you, we need labor force. Of course this was not in their mind, but this is what they told to the people. The object of telling this lie was to decrease tension, decrease uh, the possibility of a rebellion right there, you know. I mean if I, you were to kill me, might as well start killing you, you know? And they succeeded. But in addition, people, people will not endanger their lives if they think that there is a glimmer of hope that they are going to survive it. And this is what the Germans gave, this glimmer of hope, you know, that of survivability. They took us, put us into this, uh, <coughs> these cattle cars and lock the door. Those little windows that you have for air were all covered with barbed wire and we began to go. Where? We did not know. How long? We did not know. I remember about a second night after, you know, in, in that cattle car, my mother took out food 
some salami, some bread. And it was not kosher food because kosher food was not available. My mother bought it. Even though our home was strictly kosher, my mother always justified, dear God, the children must eat. And she cut us, as we said there, she cut us slices of bread and pieces of the meat and gave it to us and was crying. I asked her, Mother, in the Yiddish language as we spoke, Mother, why are you crying? And she said, look, I am had a good life. Whatever happens to me, I already had a good life. But you children never had a chance to live yet. I'm crying for that. Uh, this is an image that is so engraved in my mind, so burned into my memory that I will never forget that, you know? Your mother tears, shedding tears, crying for the future of her children. <laughs> she said she had a life, she already lived. She was only 44 at that time. And here I am at 82 reminiscing of her. <laughs> Uh, we arrived at a place <clears throat> a day later. It was early in the morning, around 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. It was pitch dark. I looked out the window and I could see three huge flames coming over there and a peculiar odor. But nothing happened. We were s s uh, staying in the, in the cars. At the sunrise, there was noises came, heard bustling. Somebody came and opened up the door of our, unlocked the door of our cattle car, and the big bird Aussteigen, namely to get out, came, was heard. We went out, and I looked around was a train station of sorts. There were buildings all around. And interestingly, two big slogans appeared on, were on the roof of the building. One was Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free. And the other one was Arbeit macht das Leben süß, work makes your life sweet. We were told to, stand, to uh, form single lines, men and women separately. My brother stayed with us, my sister went with my mother, my grandmother who was there, aunts, babies, all moved over to the, to the women's line. A rumor came that they're going to ask how old the younger children were. My father was told that to tell that my brother is 16. He was barely over 13. He was going on 14. And so when the Germans came and asked, how old is he? My father said 16. When was he born? So my father gave the month and appropriate year. He made a mistake. You see, this was in late April, and my brother's birthday was in June. Ah, said the man, so he's not 16 yet. He will be 16 in June. They took him away from us. Okay, never to be seen again. So uh, I was standing in line, and there were these couples. A capo is an Italian word meaning a supervisor. And these were inmates with that striped outfit that we had. But they had on their sleeve, on their left arm, they had a sleeve, there was a black uh, armband with the word capo written on it. And uh, a plane flew overhead. And this man looks up and he says, Oh, dear God, if he would only throw right here, right there, a bomb. 
<clears throat> so I asked the man, tell me, uh, why do you want to be bombed? Why do you want to be that for us to be killed? And the scriptic answer was, you'll find out, you'll find out. And find out we did. The signal line moved forward. There in the distance was a man clad in a leather coat. And all he did was point left and right. And as we, and we found out that if he pointed in our own direction, as he pointed right when we came there, we went to live and to work. Those who were pointed to the left were then immediately destroyed. We were entered into a courtyard, and immediately we are told to get undressed. Take everything uh, that you have, leave your clothes right on the, right on the, on the floor there. And as we got undressed, we passed by a, an array of people. One had these electric clippers, and they cut our hair and cut all our other hair, our pubic hair and everything else. Another person st uh, stood there with a, a big uh, wad of clothes, uh, you know, rags, dumped into a foul-smelling black liquid that he that smelled like creosol, you know, and that he put it under our arms and uh, other places, and he says, this is to delouse you. And then we were taken to a shower. When we got to the shower, they gave us a piece of bar, a piece of, uh, bar of soap, you know, uh, and on that soap uh, was printed RJS. Now, this is not true what I'm telling you, but this was, is what the rumor went about, what this RJS stood for. The rumor had it that this, these three letters stood for Reine Juden Seife, pure Jewish soap. Now, you know what you need for, to make soap? You need fat. And the fat which this soap was made from was the one that was rendered from the bodies which have been cremated. Now, uh, today we know that this was not true, but this is the rumor, this is the explanation that went on in those days, that here we are using soap made of, who knows, what family or who else was there. But as we took our shower, we, the only item that we were kept were our shoes. And we put our shoes in a corner of a room to uh, retrieve after the shower. And so I dutifully put my shoes in the corner, took my shower, went back to the corner to find my pair of shoes. And lo and behold, somebody made a mistake, took one of my shoes and left me, say, two right shoes. I can't remember which one, right or left. But he left me a unmatched pair. And what to do now? I mean, I cannot wear shoes like this. I ask one of the capos what to do now. He says, you see that window over there? I says, yes, I do. He says, go there and knock on the window. When the window opens up, you must begin your request with the following phrase, Ich bete gehorsam. That's in German, it means, I am humbly requesting. And then you will tell them what happened. They may give you a pair of wooden shoes. Well, a pair of wooden shoes is better than no shoes. So I go to the window, I knock at the window, the window opens up. There are two people in there. One was a German SS, and the other one was a couple. Now, the couple under, had under his arm a stick. It would have made a wonderful Irish lady. Big, knobbed, mean-looking stick. As he opened the window, he, before he asks me anything, he hits me over the head with the stick. 
just to get my attention, so to say. <laughs> and then he says, what do you want? So I am uh, starting my request with the words that the other man said, Ich bete gehorsam, I'm humbly requesting a pair of shoes. He didn't ask me why, what for, when, and so on. He hit me over the head and closed the door, I closed the window. I went back to my father, who was with me, and I cried. And I asked my father, why are you crying? So I told him the stories, but I said, emphasizing, I am not crying because it hurt the deuces. I mean, it did hurt. You get hit in the head, it hurts. But I was crying out of frustration. And my question to him, as I remember right now as clearly, how is it possible that today, in the middle of the 20th century, that man is still so inhuman to man? This question has become a central question in my life and in my research and in my writing in sociology. This inhumanity, this inequality, this uh, hostility, and where it comes from. Life in camp was a little bit over a year, but it was intense. I mean, I could sit here and talk for hours, even the little that I remember. Um, maybe I'll tell you a story. Yeah. It's a little bit uplifting. Maybe uh, your, the audience may appreciate this little story. We were finally assigned to a work camp in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, what our job was, we came there after the Germans destroyed the Warsaw Ghetto. And they made a concentration camp inside the ghetto, and our job was to work with the bricks, given uh, equipment to clean the bricks, and it was called Berlin Aufbau. The project was called Berlin Aufbau. The idea was they're going to clean these bricks, ship it to Germany, and rebuild Berlin that it now has been systematically bombed. That this is going to be the out of which the Berlin is going to be rebuilt. Well, we didn't stay in Warsaw too long, for a few months after we came there, the Russians were coming very close. One night when we came back from work, we were told that next morning we were be leaving. We got up next morning, we lined up to leave. <coughs> but before we did that, the Germans always having a little uh, surprise. The commandant of the camp said to the uh, people that it says, you know, um, all those individuals who feel who cannot walk 100 kilometers, which is about 62 miles, step out. We cannot provide transportation for everybody, but we'll give you transportation. A classmate of mine was standing right next to me. His name was Friedman. And he was going to step out. I told him, listen, don't believe the Germans. Haven't you learned yet not to believe the Germans? Oh, no, no, no. He stepped out like so many other fools. They were gathered, walked outside of the camp compound, and we heard the ratatata of the machine gun, never to be seen again. We were sitting there waiting orders to go. The orders were not coming, and the rumor was that we are next to be taken out to be killed. But you waited. Suddenly, a messenger on a motorcycle came, whispered something in the commandant's ear. We were then taken back to camp, you know, and to our uh, dwelling place, and that we will leave next day. And indeed, we left. It was a June summer day in Poland and the steppes. It was very, very hot. We had no water. 
We were in the back uh, roads of leading out because the paved roads were for the Germans. They were retreating. So we were taken to the back roads and we were going to meet a train that will take us out from there. Okay. People who were from weakness and from thirst were falling on the side. Those who fell and couldn't walk were shot right there on the road. And you know, I we used to. I all we had was a uh, a tin cup and a tin uh, plate, and I would bend down there. And the night before it rained, and there was a puddle hole, I would bend down and reach for the puddle hole and drink the water. I didn't care that it was dirty. I was thirsty. That evening we arrived to a river. Now people were so thirsty that their pandemonium broke out and people started running to the river. As the people started running for the river, the German soldiers were shoving them. So everything stopped until they permitted us to go small group by small group into the river and to drink. Um, we stood in the middle of the river drinking, bending over and drinking it like this. <laughs> you know, it reminded me uh, some of the stories about in the, old, in the Old Testament, you know, when people were uh, coming to the river, some lifted the water to their mouths, others went down to the river to drink. Uh, and But they gave us only five minutes. We walked out from the river, and then we had to lie down at the, uh, at the banks of the river. Suddenly I realized that that five minute drinking did not rehydrate me. You know, it, I was still thirsty. I tried to sleep and I saw my home with the faucets all open, you know, and water just gushing out, gushing out. So I stood up and I started doing a foolish thing. I took my uh, tin cup and my tin uh, you know, plate and I started digging into the ground. Now it was sandy. It was right on, right on the banks of the river. It was sandy. It was easy digging. My father looks at me and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm digging for water. Well, <laughs> go dig for water. And I kept on digging and at a distance of 12 by 12 to 14 inches down, something starts seeping through. I dig some more and here, really a gushing almost, you know, water coming up and spilling up this cavity. I take my cup, fill it up, give it to my father to drink. And then I drink and the people around me saw what I did and what was this, you know, what I accomplished. Everybody started digging uh, holes in the, on the banks of the river. The commandant walked over to where I was. We were not allowed to stand. It's easier to control a mess of people when you are lying on the floor, you know? And so when you looked up at the commandant, the perspective changes, you know? If you look up, everything is taller. He looked like a giant. His black boots were shined to a polish. He had his overcoat with a Persian lamb skin trimmed on, 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 on his collar. And he looks down severely, nigh lying cowering on the floor there. And he says, well, now that you found water, you might as well have it. Generous of him. Often people ask me, was that a miracle? Well, I don't know. All I can tell you is that a crazy idea entered my mind. I responded to it and it provided me with, an, with water, an item which was 
desperately needed to remain alive because I knew that without any additional water I will not make it through the next day. And Warsaw it was SS primarily. Then in another camp that was called Mühldorf Waldlager, where we were building an underground factory. The rumor had it that they developed a new airplane. And indeed they did. It was a jet plane. And they were building this this uh, in Mühldorf, which was in the, uh, the uh, Alps, you know, right in the foothills of the Alps. They were building these factories to produce jet planes. Should they have produced the jet planes somewhat earlier, the victory by the Allies would have been dubious. Huh? Because those jet planes flew faster, higher, more maneuverable than the Americans, the American planes had. Where we worked there, however, it was different. The SS guarded the parameters of the workplace, you know, the circle around it. Inside, however, the uh, the or the people and responsibility were called the organization toad. This was the work uh, organization associated with the military or the German military. So we we were brought to this place after we left uh, um, the uh, Warsaw by through Dachau and other places. We ended up there, and uh, I realized that I cannot, I will not survive on the food that they gave me and working. My job was to carry sacks of cement up to a mixing machine. Uh, the plank was about maybe 20, 25 feet and a high steep angle. Down the bottom, two people would put a sack of cement on my shoulders, and I, my job was to walk up this plank, and two other guys on top of the of the place that in the where the cement was then opened up and dumped into the mixing machine. I decided that I'm not going to work. Nice, isn't it? In the middle of the camp, there was an area with bushes. Now, summer was also cold, at, you know, there. It was up in the Alps. So what I did is I took the paper from the sacks of cement and stuffed it under my pajama-like outfit. Paper is a good insulator. And I would lie there until lunchtime. I would sneak out as though I worked, uh, full of cement powder on me. And I would stand, stand the line, get my cup of an empty soup, it was hot, drank it, and sneak back into hiding in the bushes. Should they have found me, they would have killed me. But the choice was not uh, <laughs> was a simple one. Either I, I remain living, or one way or another I'll be dead. I remember one day I talked a friend of mine, a classmate of mine who was dead, to come with me. It was the most miserable time in my life because he was constantly worried lest he will be found, that we will be found and killed. I am here, he died. It's not because I'm a, a hero or courage or anything. There came a time when death no longer frightened me. Young people are not afraid of death anyway. You know? I once had an idea that we could eliminate war from the world if we would make everybody over 45 to fight the, war, fight the war. Believe me, if you're going to force people over 45 to be fighting the war, there would be no war. Nobody over 45 would like to die. 
It's only 18 and 19 and 20 year olds who don't believe in that death is possible to them, you know, fight the war. Um, but I made peace with death. It, it, it was a kind of, I accepted it. And that's why it was easier for me to hide uh, and not to work. But later on, you know, I remember working, you know what the high holidays are, you know, the, the New Year's Day and so on. I was working on the New Year's Day on top of, I was standing, this one job was an easier job. Um, I was standing uh, where on, on uh, the platform on which there was a foreman where we poured cement, you know, to make the building. My our job was to, to use these uh, wooden planks to try to um, make the uh, cement strong and without air pockets, you know. We just jammed into it. And uh, people who knew the prayers by heart, somebody recited this prayer, and we repeated it after him, somebody said that prayer, repeated by them. But later on, as things became bad, as people were dying right and left, as we were bringing back dead people from our workplace, it, nothing mattered anymore. Uh, every morning we would get up and look at our ankles. If our ankles were swollen, we knew that our days of living were limited because our hearts and our kidneys were going. And uh, that's how it was until we were liberated. And that is a, tell you a little story about that. We came home from work and the, the uh, officer in charge, the commandant of the camp, told us um, that tomorrow a train will come and all the Jews will be taken out of the camp. Only the people in the hospital and the non-Jews, i.e. Christians, uh, would remain in the camp. Now the camp had mostly Jews. There were some gypsies. They had a little black triangle on their clothes. They were homosexuals. They had a little pink triangle on their clothes, you know. There were criminals. Interestingly enough, <coughs> they had a green triangle on their clothes. And there were communists, or, and they had a red triangle on their clothes. They will remain in camp. But the Jews will be taken out of camp. My uncle, who was a physician, was in charge of the camp hospital, a building. People went there to die, okay? He had no medicine or anything. But the Germans treated him well because he became their personal physician. They all came to him to be treated, to diagnose, to, to tell him what to do, family, children, so on. That night, so my father was already in the hospital, so was my uncle in the hospital. That night, I snuck out and under the cover of darkness and shadows, I snuck into the hospital to remain in the hospital. The idea is this. If you remain in the camp where there are non-Jews, you are most likely to survive. If you go with only with Jews, you're most likely to be shot and killed. Well, the next day came and the Jews were put on a train. Most of them, many of them died not by the hands of the Germans. Now remember, this was the end of the war. That was already the end of April. Sometimes this time, you know, a month later. Um, when the train took them up to the mountains to be killed, French fighter planes saw the train a train is a train is a train. It's a, train. It's a, a military target. And they started shooting the train and uh, until the people jumped out and they waved their 
striped clothes and they and the trains uh, stopped but by that time as the people were telling me they estimated about one third or more of the people on the train were killed not by the Germans by, by the allied French an accident of war we did not know that the Germans were going to put the hospital you know, douse the hospital with gasoline and put us a fire that was their plan but by the time they were going to do it we already heard in the morning gunshots the Americans were close by and uh, <laughs> early about seven o'clock in the morning a an SS officer comes in and he says I am comes directly to me at me he says I understand that you uh, you speak English that you write English a little and he says he gives me a note he says translate this into English and sign it and the note that he handed me was something he said that uh, I whatever his name was was good to the Jews you know and I said damn it if I'm going to write this and I'm going to sign but how do I tell him that I will not do it how can I tell him he still had his gun strapped on the side his boots were still shined to a polish how tell, do I tell this young officer that I will not shine without getting killed so I tell him you know this is too much for me I don't speak English that well you know I did but I just told him I don't speak English that well he turns around walks out nothing's happening it's very quiet we are in the hospital we are not allowed to go outside you know and to look, uh, look outside but for an hour it was extremely quiet we got to find out what's going on so uh, I'm not sure who opened or reopened the door and look out the camp was surrounded by a wall on top of the wall were these guard houses or guard places with machine guns and we look out and they are all empty there is nobody in there not a uniform to be seen so we walk out and we are there the problem was what now for over a year we moved where we are told we carried when we were told we ate when we were fed what now what are what were you, what are we to do now we're in the middle of a forest and so it was we milled around without knowing what to do we, we are dependent upon somebody to come and t tell us feed us tell us what to do we were weak I was less than a hundred pounds you know and 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 nobody's there suddenly around noon I hear a car and a tank we already the doors to the camp were opened we're outside looking to see who is coming and there was a squad of American soldiers and they were later identified they were from the 14th armored division of the third army coming to free us that caravan stopped a lieutenant came out of stopped out of the of the jeep that in which he was driving and he says does anyone speak English and they pushed me forward did I speak English he said yes I speak English somewhat and he was uh, and he said identifying himself he says I am lieutenant Schwartz of the 14th Armored Division, 3rd Army. Do you know what it meant to me, Lieutenant Schwartz? Here I am, you know, another Jewish guy, an officer in American Armed Forces, came to liberate me. Here I am, freed by him. And he asked me, what is your name? I told him 
I am Schoenfeld Eugene. And then something happened. I got back my identity. When I came to German, the German camp, they took away my name. I was never to be called by my name by any of the officials. 90,138, that was my number. That was the number that was soon in here. I was not tattooed, but that was my number. Suddenly, officially, I have given up my number until now, and I regained my name. It is only lately that my number has become again more important than my name. That's a different number, it's called Social Security. Anyway, I can't help but put that kind of things in there. And uh, I talked with him about the camp. I talked with him about a couple, and here comes a couple, a German murderer, green sign. But five foot two, if you ever want to see that, that we are descended from apes, maybe he was a prototypical example. His arms were long hanging below his knees. His brow was very short. At that time, he beat me one time, almost senseless. He had his arms, his uh, shirt rolled up, and his arms were bloody, because he found a cow and butchered a cow. And I tell him about the couple, and I tell him about how he beat me. The lieutenant takes out his forty-five, his uh, army pistol, and he hands it to me. He says, shoot him kill him, nobody is going to make any problems for you for that. I can't do that. You know, my values have been instilled into me childhood on, and killing, regardless of what, it was not one of that value. I cannot, I could not take the gun and point and shoot, regardless of any assurance that nothing is going to happen. I tell the lieutenant, thanks but no thanks. Uh, I found out that the, the uh, chief administrator, the commandant of the whole area, from Dachau area, was hiding someplace in camp, and I told him. And they called back and got more soldiers, and they systematically went from barrack to barrack to barrack, the soldiers' barracks, and they found them hiding in the basement. Later on, the next day, the lieutenant came to visit me again, and he told me that all the way back from the camp to the village, he had to run being prodded with a baseball bat not to be tardy. Anyway, that's how I was liberated. We were lousy. I'm telling you, and hungry, and sick. People were on the floor there, dead. Nobody to bury them. Next day comes a truck with some powder in it, and I became the official translator, so to say, to tell people what to do. The guys had certain masks on their faces. We stole to stand up, spread our hands, they went and sprayed this white powder into behind our clothes, back in the front and sideways and everything. And suddenly, as the, as the craziest feeling, all the lice in me, and there were so many, I could go reach in and throw out a handful like that. All these lice were scurrying, running around over my body. And then, quiet. For a year, I lived now with my lice. I was itching, I was scratching, and now this new sensation of total quietness of my body, it was not delightful, it was strange. DDT did the job, you know? We were taken, so a lieutenant, I mean, a colonel came to visit us, and naturally I had to talk with him. 
And that's the first time I heard American joke. And the colonel says to me, you know, I speak every language in the world except Greek. But all the languages in the world are Greek to me. And uh, he was telling me, talking to me, you know, I learned English, what you call the King's English, the European, the English English. And he's talking to me, and finally I stopped and I said, Colonel, are you speaking in English? He looks at me and he starts laughing. No, son, he says, I'm speaking Texan. I couldn't understand what he said, you know. Texan surely did not sound like English to me. We were taken to the hospital, or a place that created the hospital. It was a nunnery, which was made into a hospital. A lot of people still died. I was sick. Why was I sick? They found the warehouse where the German officers kept their food. Everybody ran there, so did I. Got myself some white bread, some butter, some eggs, and I come back to my father and I said, let's eat. And my father says, don't eat. I said, well, what do you mean don't eat? He says, I'm hungry. I got food. He says, your stomach is not equipped to handle this food. Oh, you know, at 19, I'm smarter than my father. So I make myself scrambled eggs and bread and butter and everything was wonderful until I got the diarrhea and I could not move away 10 yards from the bathroom, you know. So when I was, went to the hospital, they had to stop my diarrhea. All we were given to eat was oat, not oatmeal, cream of wheat, cream of wheat and vitamin pills. Vitamin pills in the morning, vitamin pills in the afternoon, and vitamin pills at night, cream of wheat and cream of wheat and cream of wheat. But we started gaining weight. I became kind of unofficial in the hospital uh, because they had to have somebody who would translate between the soldiers and the, and the, and the people. And I spoke German and I spoke Yiddish and I spoke Russian and I spoke uh, you know, Hungarian, I spoke other kind of languages, you know, and so I, I had a nice little position there, you know. Uh, now one day they came and they said, it's time to go home. Time to be repatriated. But it was interesting, but even before that, two buses came, and they were going to repatriate the French prisoners. Two young Jewish boys standing there looking at the buses and speaking Yiddish to each other. One said to the other one, do you want to go to Paris? And the other guy says, we got nothing left at home, why not? That was that, the way we thought. Life suspend the normalcy of life, the anticipation of life, the planning of life upon which we build, uh, you know, uh, life, all this disappeared. We were people in a state of what call in sociology anomie, a state of unpredictability. We didn't know from day to day what was going to happen. Living in a kind of a society which is the moment, Nothing for the future. We went back to home. There was, put us on the train. <laughs> America sent us some battles of old clothes, you know, and they were handed out. I was given, among other things, a suit, a pink suit, a houndstooth pink suit. Well, I didn't know what pink suit meant until later on when I was in Prague and I was wearing the pink suit and I started receiving all kinds of propositions. Uh, but on the way back home, we uh, stopped in Bratislava. 
to spend the night. They made put mattresses in a school and a, a, a building, and we stayed there. They provided us with food to continue our trip next day. That night, as we were lying there on the mattresses, every so often a new transport would arrive to stay overnight. The guy who had a mattress right next to me, we were talking, he was from my hometown. And a new transport came in, and suddenly he screams. See, we all used to go there and ask questions. Do you know anything about such and such a person? Have you seen anyone such and such a person? And as we went out there, he screams. Why did he scream? There was his wife. Alive, survived, and husband and wife were reunited. They came over to the metro, settled down to be together, and a new transport came in. And again, we rise up to face the transport with the inevitable question, have you seen, do you know anything? And they scream again. Now they scream. Their two daughters came. And then that evening, he can remember we were all crying. Our whole family re was reunited. We came, I came home, came back to my hometown. Hometown was dead. I visited my my home, the house I lived in, and that was occupied by gypsies who would not let us in. My aunt survived and we went over to her apartment and stayed there. And I found out that my hometown now is USSR and I told my father, I am not staying. I am leaving. I will not be in USSR. He was a very respected person in the city. So when all other stores were looted, our house was looted, but the store was not. So he says, you go on and I'm going to try to sell whatever there is and I'll follow you. I left and I finally ended up in Prague where I began attending medical school. And he would write me letters, and each letter was oh, reminiscing about my brother and my sister who were killed, my mother, and so on. Uh, it was November. I went over to my cousin, where my letters are right now, where she I used her address. And I received three letters in one day. Again, the first two I opened was the same tone crying about the death of my brother, my sister, and so on. Second, similarly. And I was not going to open up the third one. My cousin says, open it up, open it up. So I opened it up, and I found out he got married. <laughs> I was very angry, of course, because he chose uh, to stay there with a woman rather than uh, following me as we planned. I was in Prague in medical school for a number of months when again we saw the handwriting on the wall that this wonderful country that we knew, the Czechoslovakia that we knew, will no longer exist. That is becoming communist. There were four of us friends from the same school attending medical school and we decided that we are going to leave. It's a long story about this leaving, about how we're crossing the border. But we left, and we ended up in Germany, back to Germany. Although I thought I'll never see Germany again, here I was back in Germany, in Munich, in a camp again, called, uh, you know, uh, I forgot its name at this moment. And uh, this was now a DP camp, a displaced person camp, people without homes. I found out that people who work get more food, and food was a, 
most important commodity because while I was in Prague, Czechoslovakia, I was constantly hungry. I had no money. The money, the, the food that I could buy with tickets soon, they were given a pound of meat a, a, week, uh, a month. The rest of the time I would eat that which was without tickets. You could obtain without cards and that was fried blood, for instance. Uh, so I decided to go to work. I went on to the office where the three French women who were working for the United Nations were there. And I offered my services. Again, I speak English, I speak a little bit of French, I speak a little, I speak uh, Russian, this and this and this and that. Could they use my services? I am a graduate of the gymnasium. And they said yes. And soon I was working as a civilian. And about a month or so later, I was recruited to work officially for the United Nations. I became an officer in uniform. And I spent two years in Germany working there helping people, in displaced people, to migrate to start a new life someplace else. Meanwhile, I applied for a scholarship. I heard that the Hillel Foundation, a Jewish organization, gives scholarships for qualified people to come to the United States to study in the university. So I applied for the scholarships and I received it. And so by July of 1948, I came to the United States. My scholarship was uh, to Columbia University, but it was in New York. And I had no one in New York, but I had an uncle in, in St. Louis. So I asked the granting agency whether I could go to St. Louis, whether there is a college University in St. Louis. <clears throat> they said yes. And so they switched my scholarship from Columbia University. I didn't know what Columbia University was, what it was, or as prestigious, as prestigious university. And I went to Washington University. Where I met my wife, whom I married. And this coming Christmas, I'll be married to her 59 years. I told you about my uh, experience about the shoes. The question which I asked my father then, how is it possible that today, in the middle of the 20th century, there is such inhumanity of man to man? That question haunted me the rest of my life. My question was, how can we eliminate this? And particularly now what you see what is happening in the Middle East, what is happening in Africa, what was happening in, in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, the various holocausts or tribal cleansing, whatever you want to call it, still exists. I have written on that subject with the notion that the primary value, the universal value, which we has to be reinstated and retaught, is the question of justice. Christianity has brought a very interesting value, which, on which I wrote also, the value of love. But love does not act in the same manner as the principle of justice. I can love you at the same time, like we of men often do, love our wives, but at the same time not giving them their rights. If we can get a universal understanding of what rights, privileges, and duties, namely the whole question of justice, can be 
can be uh, dealt with, then and only then can we uh, uh, maybe alter the nature of human relationships which went awry for the last thousands of years. I don't care if you love me. Oh, I would love you to love me. But if I have a choice between you love me and you giving me my rights, my, my privileges, the one that I share with you, then I'll take the latter one. I'll take the latter one. That, that is what's the most important thing. That is what motivated my writing, my thinking, my talking. And that is the need to reestablish the prophetic notion. I'm talking about people like Isaiah and Micah, the prophetic notion of justice. Let there be love, but above everything else, the pinnacle of human relationship must be the reestablishment of justice. This is what we thought was the women's movement. This is what it was the black movement because love was not sufficient, justice must reign. And if one thing that I've learned from my experiences and later experiences, lifetime experiences, is that no human association like country or, or international association until we can reestablish the principle of universal justice and abide by it. I need that religion should start teaching not the notion of salvation. God is God is God and he's going to do what he's going to do. I don't care what you say. Nobody really knows what God is or what God does. I am a Jew and I follow with the Jewish principle. And the Jewish principle is that this world is a world that is given to us for us to deal with. The sin that we commit against each other is far greater and more grievous than the sins that we commit against God. And this is our world. The world which we live in is a human world. It's not a godly world. And so it's up to us to establish that. If there is anything that I was able to or could have transmitted to as an ideal to my students, this is the ideal that I want to transmit. And I want it always to transmit. Not depressed, but uh, um, aimless. I was in medical school and I couldn't study. First of all, I didn't speak Czech that well. And when I cut, I did, my heart was not in it. For a long time, I was unable to establish stability in my life. That is what most of the people who came out uh, lacked. Some sort of stability. Look, What is most important in life, here I'm going preaching again, what is the most important in life is the ability to predict, you know? Um, you know that you go to school, why? You go to school so that if I go to school, See, you have this if-then proposition. If I go to school, then I will learn some a trade or I'll learn something, something which will give me a, a certain amount of income. I will be able to get married, to establish my life, to, and to do something for my retirement. Okay? All of our life is based upon such if-then propositions. The greatest tragedy in humankind is when you lose the ability to work on this if-then proposition. That becomes aimlessness. And aimlessness of this sort creates anger and creates uh, what you call maybe even depression. This is what Hitler did. 
He took a society in which had 40% of unemployment. The money was worthless. Uh, I had a stamp of 1920s, uh, in the 1928, uh, just before Hitler came to power, so to say, that the stamp value was one mark. And each time they put a new, re-stamped it with a new cost on it. The last one that I had was a this stamp was 14 million marks. Now, can you imagine if a, a postal stamp, you would have to pay $10 million? Money had low, no value. People had no future. They did not know what is going to happen. This is when people are most subject to the influence of such leaders, what you call false messiahs, or leaders who are uh, charismatic leaders with false aims. And, and this is when you are unable, when this, this if-then proposition broke down and, and uh, the stability, which was based upon this predictability of the if-then if proposition of predictability disappeared. Uh, this is what I want, um, I also try to tell students that how much we depend upon this if then you know propositions more now than ever before because before you could be an independent person you can no longer be an independent person you work for a salary you work for a salary you work for a salary you work and i did work and i work for a salary you know and we all work, and we are all interdependent by this working. None of us is free of the forces, of the economic forces. You cannot have your plot of land and get your food and live on it, you know, as in the past. This is a different world. The world, the values of the past no longer apply to us right now. We created a different world. We must create now a value system which reflect this new world and this new world of totally dependence. There are eternal values, namely that each human being has a right to, uh, to be given a chance to life. Okay? All the, this is an old Jewish value. <laughs> Have you, you read the Bible? You know, in the Bible it says that in the olden days, and only in Judea, the land, when you went to harvest the land, the corners of the field had to be left free. This was for the poor. They had a right to it. The, the owner of the land couldn't tell, you cannot come to harvest. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to the poor. It was, in their way, a kind of a social security, meaning we must give you a chance to live. And this is the whole story of Ruth, you know, that they were given a second chance to live. We must provide people with a chance to live. And justice is based upon this element of giving people equal as. Uh, uh, opportunity to a chance to life. If anything else, this is my message to future generation. Faith is nice for you personally, but faith without giving a chance to life, like James said, faith without works don't count. 